So great. So this is section 18.5. We've already looked at primary structure. So we spent some time looking at primary structure, which was simply the, the um, order in which the amino acids are found in a peptide or a protein. And then we looked at secondary structure, which consists of alpha helices, alpha helices, and beta pleated, beta pleated sheets. Okay. And here we could just put order, order of amino acids like that. So now we've moved on to tertiary structure. Now, the three dimensional structure of the entire peptide, which is distinct from secondary structure, is classified as tertiary structure. Globular tertiary structure forms spontaneously and is maintained by interactions among side chains or R groups. So if you remember, in the alpha helix, we saw that all the R groups were on the outside. We've already looked at the structures of the various R groups. We can have hydrophobic R groups. We can have polar neutral R groups. We can have positively charged R groups, right? The basic ones. And we can have negatively charged R groups, the acidic ones. And so if you think about all those different types of R groups, they can interact with each other based on intermolecular forces. And tertiary structure is what actually defines the biological function of proteins. Here are the types of interactions that maintain tertiary structure. Do you remember the cysteine um, amino acid? Here's cysteine. Okay, these are two cysteines. And on a cysteine was a thiol, right? RSH, right? So here's the SH and here's another SH. Well, you probably remember that I told you way back in the beginning of this class that when we're talking about oxidation and reduction in organic chemistry, the oxidation can be defined as the loss of hydrogen or the gain of oxygens. And when we take those two thiols, the two SHs here, when you lose two hydrogens, that's going to be an oxidation, and we form a disulfide bond. So this is a disulfide bond. Okay. Now that's a covalent bond. So that's going to be really, really strong. And what you need to know is that when you go from cysteine to cysteine, so this is cysteine here, that it's an oxidation reaction, and that the cysteine that's formed has a disulfide bond. Okay. Those are the things that you need to know. Now, that's the first type of, of uh, interactions that produce tertiary structure. The next type is what we call a salt bridge. Think about it. If I have an R group that has a carboxylate on it, let's say from glutamate or aspartate, and let's say I have a basic you know, portion from, from lysine, let's say, what's going to happen? We're going to have an electric interaction between the negative charge on the carboxylate and the positive charge on the nitrogen. So that's the second type of interaction that maintains tertiary structure. What else? We can have hydrogen bonds. What if we have two polar residues, right, that can hydrogen bond? Okay, that's a possibility. And then the last type is a hydrophobic interaction. What if we have two groups that are just simply hydrocarbons, right? What if you have, let's say, a valine, which is this, an isopropyl, and let's say it's close to an alanine, which is nothing more than a methyl. Well, remember, we can have London forces, right, interacting between those two hydrophobic groups, okay? Here they say they're attracted by a mutual repulsion of water, right, because they're both water heating. Now, again, it's another one of those examples where a picture is worth a thousand words. This big diagram that you see on here, all these like ribbons twirling around, looks like that um, ribbon that gymnasts twirl around at the Olympics or whatever. That ribbon is actually called a ribbon diagram. And in that ribbon, we have all the different amino acids, okay, all linked together in our, in our protein. But we leave them all out, okay? We're just, in, and you're like, well, why would you leave them out? Then it just looks like a ribbon. That looks horrible to me. Well, it depends on the situation, okay? Sometimes if you just want to look at the shape of the protein, just looking at the ribbon diagram can be very helpful, okay? Now here they've shown the ribbon diagram and you can see if you start over here, you know, look at this, you got some spirals here, 
like an alpha helix, then there's nothing here. Then you have another alpha helix here, okay, and then it spirals around, you know, so on and so forth. Okay, so you follow that, that peptide along. But what else she's done in this structure is she's actually highlighted these different types of interactions involved in tertiary structure. Look, she's got an amino portion from an R group and a carbonyl over here. And what's she showing? She's showing a hydrogen bond between those two residues. Here we have two hydroxyls. Okay, maybe it's from two tyrosines, maybe it's from two serines, maybe it's from two thiorenines. Maybe it's a serine and a, and a tyrosine. I don't know. It doesn't matter. That's not important. What's important is that those R groups are both capable of hydrogen bonding. And so we have a hydrogen bond. And that's why these two portions of the protein are close together. Here we have a disulfide bridge. Here we have another disulfide bridge, right? That's a covalent bond. Those are really strong. Look at this. Let's say both of these aromatic rings, where could they come from? Phenylalanine. So we have two phenylalanines they're going to be attracted by that mutual repulsion of water or London forces. Same thing here. We have a valine and an alanine. Hydrophobic, right? So we call that a hydrophobic interaction. And then the last one that's shown on here is a salt bridge. We have a carboxylate from one R group and we have a protonated amine from a basic R group. There we go. We have that electrostatic interaction. And so what do we have? If we list them all, we've got salt bridges, We've got hydrophobic interactions. We've got hydrogen bonding. And we've got disulfide, disulfide bridges, bridges. Okay, if you were to break all of these, um, all of these interactions that produce tertiary structure, the biological activity of the protein would be lost. It's destroyed. Okay. It's ruined. In fact, we're going to look at, you know, the process of destroying these interactions that are involved in tertiary structure. Okay. It's called denaturing, denaturing a protein. If you've ever, um, you know, baked cookies before or tried to grab a hot cookie sheet or something that's really hot, and you see that your skin burns immediately and it kind of turns like a yellow color maybe and it gets kind of crusty. Well, you've killed the skin. What you've done is you've denatured the proteins in your skin. So you've destroyed, you know, some of these interactions. Okay? And we're going to talk about that more later on in this chapter. Here's another picture I took from a different book. You can see on the far left the hydrogen bonds from a beta pleated sheet and this so shows parallel a, meh, an anti-parallel beta pleated sheet i'm trying to do this yeah so we have a hydrogen bond shown here we have a hydrogen bond between a carbonyl and an amino group here we have another one here between a primary amide and a carbonyl there what else we've got an electrostatic interaction they left it the charges there should be a positive and a negative here so we're going to have that electrostatic interaction or a salt bridge just another way of saying it, a salt bridge is an electrostatic interaction. We have a disulfide bond here. We have London dispersion forces, right? The London dispersion forces, that's the same thing as the hydrophobic. Hydrophobic, okay? Interactions, same darn thing. Uh, other hydrogen bonds shown in an alpha helix. A hydrogen bond shown, this would be what, a threonine? and um, a serine here, so on and so forth. Look, give me a thumbs up if you just follow me on the idea, okay, that you have the primary structure of a protein, it's just the order of the amino acids are linked together, the peptide bonds, then the first type of secondary, or the first type, of, uh, sorry, secondary structure is either an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet held together. Both of those are held together only by hydrogen bonding. And then beyond that, the protein can fold in on itself and it's not random. Okay, let me actually turn the camera off just for the presentation out here, just for a second. Let me broadcast myself. Okay, look, sometimes talking with your hands actually works when you're a science teacher. Look, 
if you have a protein, okay, let's say we have a protein that's something like this, okay, big long chain of amino acids, okay, it's going to, the, the primary structure is just all the amino acids linked together. Secondary structure is an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet, fine, okay. Let's say my protein doesn't have either of those, but the protein is going to fold in on itself, okay. That's when it forms the globular structure, but it's not random. It doesn't do this sometimes and do this another time and do this another and do that, right? It's always going to fold the same way. Okay, so it's not those interactions that cause tertiary structure are not random. Okay, it's always going to fold in on this in the same way. Okay, the same R groups are going to interact with the same R groups to produce, and that's what gives it its biological activity. All right, so the folding. Don't think it's just, hey, it's, it folds up any old way. It's different every time. No, no, no. It is not random at all. Okay. Uh, let me start the broadcast again. There we go. Okay. Primary, secondary, tertiary structure with well, the last type of structure in a protein is quaternary structure. Now, before we get into it, do you remember in the last section how we took a protein and it folded in on itself? to give us tertiary structure? Well, if you have two or more proteins that have tertiary structure, they can interact together, right? And form hydrogen bonds and hydrophobic interactions and salt bridges, so on and so forth. That's quaternary structure, okay? That when we have two or more proteins bound together um, based on those, or uh, by those same interactions that we've already looked at, that's what quaternary structure is. So follow me on the slide. It says here, the functional form of many proteins is not that of a single polypeptide chain, but it's actually an aggregate or a conglomeration of several globular pep peptides. Quaternary structure is the arrangement of subunits or peptides that form a larger protein. So look, subunits, all that means is that in order for, um, let's say, if you have a protein that has quaternary structure, it needs to have the two or more proteins bound together in order to have the structure. So each part, we call it a subunit, all right? So a subunit is a polypeptide chain having primary, secondary, tertiary structure, and then it conglomerates or um, uh, forms an aggregate of several polypeptide chains to produce quaternary structure. The good news is that you don't have to learn any new kind of forces. Quaternary structure is maintained by the exact same forces that you learned in tertiary structure. What were they? Disulfide bonds, salt bridges, hydrophobic interactions, and hydrogen bonding. Those are the four types of forces that maintain tertiary structure, and the exact same ones are what maintain quaternary structure. Nothing new. Here's an example of a protein, a, poly, uh, a protein that contains primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. You've probably all heard of hemoglobin. It's a protein that's found in red blood cells and it's responsible for carrying oxygen throughout the circulatory system. The primary structure is just the amino acids linked together, the order that they're linked together. You can see that in hemoglobin, we have secondary structure. For example, there's an alpha helix found inside hemoglobin. Now that, he, that alpha helix is found in a big chain, that has tertiary structure, right? What caused this polypeptide chain to fold in on itself like that? Remember, this folding here, you see how it looks like it's all kind of random squiggle? It's not random, is it? No, it's not random. It's folded in in order to produce that tertiary structure, which is part of the biological activity of the molecule. Now, if you're wondering about this thing in the middle here, that's the heme unit with iron down inside of it, and the iron is what binds to oxygen. Anyhow, we'll talk about that more later, but that's our tertiary structure. And what you see is that hemoglobin is actually made up of four different proteins with tertiary structure. It's got two alpha subunits and two beta subunits, okay? So again, the quaternary structure is formed when we have two or more, in this case, we have four, polypeptides that have tertiary structure and they're held together. Like what's holding these four together? The same type of interactions that hold tertiary structure together. Disulfide bridges, salt bridges, hydrogen bonds, and 
hydrophobic interactions or London forces. There you have it, folks. Here's another example of primary structure. And it's just showing how we have the amino acid sequence that gives us our primary structure. We can have an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. Then once we have those alpha helices and beta pleated sheets, when they fold in on each other, when the protein chain folds in on itself, we get tertiary structure. And then if we have two or more, and in this case, we have, looks like we have four of them bound together, right? What's holding them together here and here and here, the same interactions, and that's quaternary structure. Remember, the biological activity comes from tertiary and quaternary structure. Biological activity doesn't come from primary or secondary structure. No, no, no. Because even if we destroy the alpha, if we destroy the alpha helix or the beta pleated sheet, or sorry, if we destroy the the, um, the um, tertiary or quaternary structure, the protein will lose its biological activity. Simple as that. All righty. I'm not going to ask you anything about proteins requiring prosthetic groups. So um, this section is a view of protein structure and function. We spoke at length about primary structure. And if you're wondering, hey, Mr. Dion, you're repeating yourself a lot. I am on purpose. OK, uh, it's kind of the way the book is laid it out. But she wants to make sure that you understand that primary structure is the amino acid sequence, right? And NC carbonyl, right? NC carbonyl. We have our carboxylate on the C terminus. We have our protonated amine on the N terminus. We have hydrogens on the carbons like this. Uh, NC carbonyl. Like that. Then we have our R groups here. So that's the order. Um, and they're a result of covalent peptide bonds. Here's a peptide bond. Secondary structure includes the alpha helix, the beta pleated sheet. What holds an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet together? Nothing more than hydrogen bonding. That's it. Tertiary structure is the folding of a big polypeptide chain. Why would it fold? Why the heck would it even do that? It's because of the interactions between different amino acid side chains. What are the interactions? Disulfide bridges, salt bridges, hydrophobic interactions, and hydrogen bonding. Quaternary structure, same thing, but now we have two or more polypeptide chains coming together. Okay, they can also involve disulfide bridges and the non covalent interactions, which are what? Salt bridges, hydrogen bonding, and um, hydrophobic interactions. I know I've repeated them a lot, but I don't think you'll forget them now. So, protein functions um, we have fibrous proteins that provide mechanical strength in our muscles and structural components in our body, um, globular proteins that are involved in um, transport and enzymes. And we're going to do a whole chapter on enzymes later on. I want to talk about two interesting proteins for a minute here, myoglobin and hemoglobin. I'm sure that most of you have heard of hemoglobin if you studied biology. Maybe you haven't heard of hemo. Uh, sorry, I'm sure that most of you have heard of hemoglobin, but maybe you haven't heard of myoglobin. Hemoglobin is the oxygen transport protein of higher animals. So it's how we move oxygen around our body. And myoglobin is the oxygen storage protein in our muscle. Um, oxygen is transferred from myoglobin as it's carried throughout the circulatory system. And it's transferred from the hemoglobin to myoglobin and the muscle. Now, why would it be, how would it be transferred? How would that even happen, right? It must mean that myoglobin has a greater affinity for oxygen than hemoglobin does. And that is, in fact, true. Here's the structure of myoglobin. So this is myoglobin shown right here. You see all the residues are shown here. You can see all the amino acids all linked together. And inside the tertiary structure, we have something that's not an amino acid. And we call that a heme group, H-E-M-E. -E. And inside that heme group, you can see there's an iron atom. That's an iron atom right there. And that iron atom is what interacts with the oxygen and binds with the oxygen in order to carry it around the body. And if you're thinking, like, what? I have, I have to have all of this to carry one oxygen molecule around? You're darn right. You're darn right. OK? Um, here's the heme group. This is um, the structure of the heme group shown here. On the right, you can see there's a lot of carbon. 
in hydrogen, but it also has some nitrogens in it. And those nitrogens interact with an iron, two plus ion, and that is where the oxygen binds. Now, something that's beyond the scope of our class is you probably notice, you're like, well, these aren't covalent bonds. What's up with these dashed bonds here? It looks like the two covalent and two dashed ones there. It's called a coordination complex. It's beyond the scope of our class, but I'll just tell you that the nitrogens kind of hold the, the iron inside the heme unit. So each hemoglobin contains a heme group which can hold um, uh, one molecule of oxygen. Both hemoglobin and myoglobin are globular and conjugated proteins, meaning that con they contain both a protein and a non-protein unit. Right, the non-protein unit is the heme unit. It's an organic complex. It's called a porphyrin, and it surrounds that iron 2 plus ion. And the iron 2 plus is what binds oxygen gas and carries it around the bloodstream. Then the hemoglobin um, transports the oxygen to wherever it's needed in the body. And of course, myoglobin stores it in our tissues. Here again is the ribbon diagram of myoglobin. You can see it's got 153 amino acids all together. So that's a lot of, you know, amino acids that have to be put together to make this one protein. And here's the heme unit on the inside. Okay, and here's the iron atom right there. You know, what do you see in this structure? I mean, it's a ribbon diagram, but right, wherever they have these kind of curls in it here, those are alpha helices, right? They're shown explicitly. And where you don't have those, that just means there's, there's nothing, right? There's the amino acids linked together, but there's no secondary structure there, okay? And why is the whole chain folded in like that? Well, it's because the myoglobin protein has tertiary structure. Is it shown here explicitly in this, you know, in this uh, ribbon diagram? Is it showing hydrophobic interaction, salt bridges, so on and so forth? No, it's not. But remember, this isn't folded in just randomly, okay? It's folded in in order to give it its biological activity. In fact, I'll do one better. The porphyrin ring here, the hydrocarbon portion, um, that's actually going to be held in, you know, by the protein itself. Now that's pretty complicated um, how it's held in there, but that's you know why it's not just suspended there, you know, hanging in thin air. It's actually held in by by the protein. Here's hemoglobin. Here's the structure of hemoglobin. You can see that you've got the four subunits. You have a subunit here, you have another one here, another one here, and another one here. And in each one of those subunits, you have a heme, right? There's one here, 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 and here. So hemoglobin has four polypeptide chains, each carrying one heme unit. Here's a variant of hemoglobin. It's called fetal hemoglobin. Um, the adult hemoglobin has two alpha subunits and two beta subunits, subunits, where the fetal hemoglobin has two alpha subunits and two um, delta subunits. Now, if you're like, well, why would a fetus need different hemoglobin than, than the mother? And the reason why is because fetal hemoglobin is going to have a greater affinity for oxygen. Otherwise, the baby would not get oxygen. It wouldn't be transported from the mother's bloodstream. Um, if you've ever heard of sickle cell anemia, it's a disease that results in a single amino acid residue um, being different in two of the subunits of hemoglobin. So literally, you just change one amino acid okay, residue, you just swap it out, and you end up with a disease. So you, you can imagine that the sequence of amino acids in our proteins are very important. Okay. Um, anyhow, I won't talk about that anymore. It's covered in one of my videos. And I go into more detail about that. Um, I'll just tell you that section 18.9, I'm not going to ask you anything about that section on your exam, on your on your next exam. And we'll call it quits. Uh, no, we got five minutes left. Let's talk about denaturation a little bit. So I told you that if you have an effect on, if, if you affect, um, a protein in such a way that you destroy secondary, tertiary, or quaternary structure, we call that denaturation. 
And extremes of temperature and pH can have a drastic effect on protein conformation. Think about it. What holds alpha helices together? Nothing more than hydrogen bonds. So if you put an alpha helix in an extremely acidic environment, what's it going to do? It's going to protonate the oxygens of the hydroxyls, and it's going to break those hydrogen bonds. Now, I'm not going to ask you, like, draw me the reaction of what happens when a occurs. But if you have an extreme temperature or pH um, and you expose your, your protein to that, it's going to cause, cause the loss of the organized structure. Okay. It doesn't alter, alter primary structure, right? That would be breaking the covalent bond. But you see how the alpha helix is all organized? If you're to heat that up high enough, it's going to denature it, right? Why would that be? Think about it. If we have... Can you guys see me? Can everybody see me? Can you see me? Okay, good. Thanks. Thanks, Vanessa. Thanks, Johnny. Think about it. If you have an alpha helix, right, it's held together tight like this, right? You get that helical shape. If you heat that up, I mean, what's holding it together? Nothing more than hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds aren't covalent, right? A hydrogen bond is only about 1 20th the strength of a covalent bond. So if you heat it, what's going to happen to a molecule when you heat it? It starts moving faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And then eventually, once it gets heated up so much that, boom, it's going to break those hydrogen bonds and the alpha helix lost. Same thing applies to a beta pleated sheet. Same thing in your globular structure, right? You have the protein folded in on itself. If you heat it up high enough, high enough, high enough, eventually you're going to heat it up so high that it's going to break those weak interactions like a salt bridge or a hydrophobic interaction, okay? The covalent bonds that hold the protein together, they're still there. But the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure can be destroyed by increase in temperature or a change in pH. You can even break, um, um, you can even denature a protein just with, me with mechanical power, just with your muscle. If you've ever made, um, has anybody ever made meringue before? Tried to make a, a lemon meringue? Or has anybody ever beat it, beaten an egg before? Okay, what you're doing when you whip, when you whip an egg, right? All you're doing is mechanical stress is actually breaking the, the, the um, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure in the egg albumin. Nothing more than that. Now, okay, cool. Yeah, awesome. So I have more information about that in my videos. Okay, um, there we go. So for the rest of this chapter, I'll refer you to my videos, uh, my playlist on chapter 18 in my YouTube channel which covers the entire chapter from A to Z. Every single section of chapter 18 is in there. There's nothing missing in it, and it's all perfectly laid out.